your way. Well, Mark chapter 5, verse uh, 21. The passage says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. And so Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged around him. As we look at the beginning of the story, we see that Jairus was a man, he was a religious man, but he was a man that had a great crisis in his life. Like only a father would know, his daughter was sick and at the point of death. And in that place as a father is suddenly feeling powerless to be able to help his daughter. In this position of crisis, he did the best thing. He said, in my position of powerlessness and crisis and trauma, I'm going to reach out to Jesus. And he went to pursue Jesus and asked Jesus to come and to lay hands on his daughter that she would live, that she would be healed. Because she was at a place of crisis. And the first thing that we can learn as I look at this passage is simply that sometimes in life, every one of us hit points where our natural abilities finish. Our natural power finishes. We can hit a point of crisis or need. It could be a big one or it could be a small one. But at that point, whether it's for someone we love, for ourselves, maybe for a business situation or a career, maybe because of sickness or some other issue of life, we get to a point where we realize on our own we cannot solve the situation. And sometimes it can put us into a place of stress or burden or worry. But we need to have the wisdom of Jairus is that he said when he came into a place where he was stuck, he reached out to Christ. He moved into a place of prayer. As he began to pray, as he began to cry out to Christ, as he pursued Christ, Jesus moved with him. Jesus took on his project. Jesus said, I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to undertake to, uh, to fix the situation. You see, in the things of life, one of the things that we can learn is that when we hit a place of crisis that we reach out to God. The Bible says in James, it says, if any of you are in trouble, let him pray. As we pray, faith gets released in our heart. The, the worries, the stress that just begins to drop away and faith gets released in our heart. And we realize that Jesus is with us in this situation. Faith gets released to us as we pray. And then as we look in the, the story in verse 25, it says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, had suffered many things from many physicians. She'd spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind them in the crowd and she touched his garment. For she said, If only I may, I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. I find it wonderful how God has arranged this story. Because you see, we're, we're talking about Jairus and his daughter. And Jesus saying, I'm going to come, I'm going to go to your house. And suddenly the story changes and talks about someone completely different. And suddenly Jesus is delayed on his mission to help Jairus. And instead, he is helping somebody else. And that's wonderful for the story. But it's not great for Jairus. Because Jairus has got a crisis. And I'm sure he is basically saying, Come on, can we please keep moving? But Jesus stops. Somebody else gets healed. And you know, it's a great lesson for us to learn that sometimes when we cry out to God and we touch Him, we know He hears our voice, sometimes our answer is delayed. 
And at a place where your answer is delayed, you know the worst thing sometimes that can happen is when somebody else receives the answer that you wanted. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says we should rejoice with those who rejoice. We should mourn with those who mourn. But human nature sometimes, we, we, re, we mourn when somebody else is rejoicing. And we rejoice when somebody else is mourning. In other words, something good happens for them. You think, ah, oh, that was what I wanted. How did they get the promotion? I needed the promotion. You know, how did they get a son? I wanted a son. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You see, it's sometimes the hardest thing when you're asking God to do something is to see that somebody else gets the touch. Somebody else gets a miracle perhaps that you were waiting for. And Jairus had to learn to be happy for the woman who had suffered all these years even though he was still anxiously waiting for his miracle. Does that make sense? And that sometimes God allows us to be delayed and during that time when our vision or our prayer is not being fulfilled, we will see other people having their prayers answered. Other people may be receiving what we were asking for. And uh, God says we should rejoice together. We should be a family together. And then we see if we jump down to verse 35, because all of this time now Jesus is getting busy with His own uh, ministering to this woman. And then talking to the crowd about it, verse 35, we pick up again the story with Jairus. And it says that while he was still speaking, this is uh, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, that's Jairus. And they said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? There's one thing worse than the prayers being delayed. Is it when things get worse? As you're waiting for Jesus to do a miracle for you, as you're waiting for Jesus maybe to move on your behalf in your situation, sometimes things get worse. Yeah, I prayed. I touched the heart of God. Faith got released in me. I really believe that God is going to be working on my behalf. Why is it going backwards? She was sick when I left, but now they've come to me and said, as Jairus has said, that she's passed away. Here I have come to Jesus for help. And I see Him ministering to other people. And I see other people getting helped. But in what I was asking, asking for, it's actually gone backwards. It's actually got worse. Anybody relate ever to that? You see, we get to walk with Jesus. <coughs> the privilege of the relationship we have with God is that Jesus calls us to walk with Him. And sometimes our prayers are answered in a moment, but sometimes we have a journey that we need to walk on in faith. And as we walk on that journey, something grows. Our faith grows, our confidence grows, but also our relationship grows. I remember when I re-entered India after many years when I was away. I went back now as a 20-year-old. I'd been away for, sorry, I went as a 19-year-old. I'd been away for a number of years. I only knew a smattering of Telugu because I went to an international school in the south of India in a place called Uti. And for some reason, they taught us French and German. <laughs> I have no idea why. So. And then later our family moved to Bangalore and so the language was different there. And then we moved back to Vijuwada. And so the only bit of Telugu I learned was just playing with some of the local kids in the compound. I didn't know any Telugu, they didn't know any English, but somehow we were able to communicate. And, um, and so I only had a smattering of Telugu. And when I arrived back in India after many years being away, I got on a train and I was traveling in these wonderful Indian trains. How many of you have been on an Indian train? How many of you just love the experience? I just love the experience. How many have been on the roof of an Indian train? <laughs> uh, you know, hanging out the doors. And uh, as I was traveling in this long distance train ride, the person opposite me, a wonderful older gentleman, he didn't know a word of English. And I didn't know a word of 
his language. I'm not sure whether it was Telugu or Hindi or what. But we had to sit opposite each other for, you know, like eight, nine hours. And we developed a relationship. And it started like this. He, he had a whole bunch of bananas. <laughs> and so he would take one banana and he'd go. <laughs> I said. <laughs> he'd go. And I go, I have a banana. After the train had traveled a little bit more, he'd get another banana. They were good bananas. And then a guy would come along with tea, and I'd stop him, and I'd say, and I'd get a cup of tea, and I'd say, and he'd go. And I'd order him a cup of tea. No, no, you have to. Oh, okay, okay. And so during our, uh, our journey, we developed a relationship but we couldn't speak to each other. And, uh, and sometimes as we journey with Jesus, it's not just about us having our prayers answered, but the process of walking with Him, the process of seeking Him, the process of prayer, it builds faith and it builds relationship. And as Jairus was learning to walk with Jesus, he had the privilege of being in His presence for longer. As God delays, sometimes He delays for our benefit. And so, as we look back at the story, the news came to Jairus and said, Don't bother Jesus anymore. He's busy and now it's over. Your daughter has died. And um, Jesus turned to him in verse 36 and said to Jairus, To Jairus, do not be afraid. Only believe. The Bible says the work of God is to believe in the one that He has sent. That we trust in Him and have faith. And so now He had to walk in faith, with Jesus, believing that the impossible was going to happen. Even though his emotions, I'm sure, would have been really stirred by the news he'd heard from his house, that is, that his daughter had died. And so as we look in the story, Jesus, in verse 37, Jesus permitted no one to follow them except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And then... He came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and he saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why are you making this commotion and weeping? For the child is not dead, but sleeping. And verse 40, it says, And they ridiculed him. They began to mock him. But when he put them outside, we just stop there. He put them outside. Here we see something. As Jesus neared the house, the home of Jairus. And when he came in, all the neighbors, all the friends, all the family were there. They were weeping and wailing because of the catastrophe. But when Jesus came in, listen to what he did. He spoke a word of faith. He came into a place of mourning and he said, the child is not dead, but just asleep. I want to tell you something. Sometimes when we hit a situation or a trouble or a problem, we can magnify it. We can, we can talk about it. We can make it bigger. We can exaggerate it. We can worry about it. We can talk to our neighbors about it, our family about it. We can complain about it. And it can just get bigger and bigger until your storm is actually getting larger because you're fanning the flames. You're speaking about it, you're talking about it, other people are speaking about it, you're complaining about it, you're negative about it. And Jesus wants to step into your world at times like that. And He does the actual opposite. He actually minimizes your problem. It's not that He doesn't understand, it's not that He doesn't care, but He walked into Jairus' world and instead of saying, yeah, she's pretty dead, she's cold, she's really dead. This is terrible. She's been dead for a long time. Look how cold she is. He didn't do that. He came in and he spoke life. He said, she's not actually dead. She's just sleeping. You know, he minimized it. You see, the Bible says we should magnify the Lord. Sometimes we magnify our problems. But the Bible says we should magnify the Lord. We should make Him bigger and our issues smaller. Do you know when, sometimes when you're going through a faith challenge, or maybe you're going through a storm. 
Maybe you're having to wait for something that you believe that God has promised you to come to pass. You know, you'll get cheerleaders that will gather around you and wail and feed your unbelief. You'll get lots of people that will tell you why it can never happen. And then your own mind can become your worst enemy. How many relate to this? Sometimes your mind can begin to think in the middle of the night. My wife always says, everything seems more important in the middle of the night. <laughs> you can wake up in the middle of the night and you can begin to worry about something. Then you can begin to have conversations with people who are involved, but they're not in the room. Amen? You can begin to think about, what if this person said that? Then I would say this. And then they're going to say this. And then I'm going to say this. And suddenly you get in a fight and then you realize they're not in the room. <laughs> the Bible says in Philippians, it says, Whatsoever is true, think on these things. And sometimes, you know, when we're in a crisis or a storm or a problem, sometimes we can begin to think of things that are just not true. We can begin, what if, what if this happened? But you know, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. He said, today has enough problems for itself. In other words, don't try to dream up more problems than you already have. <laughs> you see, because sometimes we can go through life and we, get, we can begin to plan for possible problems. It's called fear. And Jesus says this, He says, you know, actually, if you deal with the real problems you have, that's enough. Actually deal with the real situation. You see, sometimes, as has happened with Jairus, there was a huge storm. There was a huge tumult, they call it. There was neighbors and friends, everybody was wailing. But it was unnecessary because Jesus was going to bring an answer. And in our life... Sometimes our words, our worries, our conversations, our stresses are unnecessary because Jesus is going to bring His peace. So when He stepped into that situation, He said, the girl is not dead, she's sleeping. He can speak into your situation and He wants to minimize your problems and maximize His glory. He wants to say to you, no, I'm going to do a work in the middle of this situation, but I need to cooperate with you. And you know what He asked? He asked Jairus, to cooperate with Him. How many you know that Jesus doesn't just zap you, He wants to walk with you? He doesn't simply just work always sovereignly. Sometimes He asks for your participation, for your prayer, for your faith, for your partnership with Him. And so Jairus had to do something to work with Jesus. Do you know Jesus will always give us something to do to work with Him? When Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead, he said to the sisters, you roll away the stone. That's your job. My job is I'm going to raise the dead. But your job is to roll away the stone. Sometimes we just want to sit down on our easy chair and say, Jesus, roll away the stone. And Jesus said, I'm not going to roll. I asked you to roll away the stone. There's sometimes there's things that God asks us to do. And uh, there are things that we need to do. And so here with Jairus, we see a situation. Friends, family have come into his house to show love and care and support. And Jesus says, I want you to kick them all out of your house. That's rude. What he's saying to Jairus' world is, if I'm going to work in your life, I need you to make some changes to this big storm that's happening right here. I'm going to bring a miracle, but I want you to change the atmosphere in your house from one of mourning to one of faith. So for us, sometimes as God works, He says the same thing to us. He says, I need you to change the way you speak about some of your challenges. Or the way you think, or the way you, you pray. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, it says, Death in life is in the power of the tongue. And those who, who love it will eat its fruit. Now, sometimes for us to work with God, we have to change the way that we speak, or think, or relate about the situation. For Jairus, 
he had to remove some guests from his house. I don't know exactly how he did that. Whether he just turned on a fire alarm, everybody ran outside, then he just locked the door. I don't know. Whether he said there are samosas and tea outside if anybody wants, they all ran out. <laughs> and then he locked the door. I don't know what he did to remove those people from the house. But what Jesus said is you need to change the atmosphere in your home. Now listen very carefully. We don't learn from this that we should not associate with unbelievers. That's not what the story is about. Because you see, Jesus is perfect theology. And he was, the Bible says, that he was friends with tax collectors and sinners. He was friends with them. Now they didn't affect the atmosphere in his life. He affected them. But he was friends with them. But I think what this is saying is sometimes when we are in a time of precious faith, we need to guard the atmosphere around our life and those people that speak into it. So there are some people you guard your heart to their opinion because they're coming from a perspective where they don't understand what God wants to do. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means that you guard the atmosphere of your life. All of us are responsible for, for the atmosphere in our home, in our world, in our minds. It means that maybe we need to turn the off switch to some of our worries and turn it on to the Word of God. How as we say, enough of what I'm thinking, what's God thinking? You know, Isaiah 55, it says, My ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts, says the Lord, for they are higher. And then it goes on to say how much higher God's ways are from our ways, how much higher God's thinking is to our thinking. It says, even as the heavens are higher than the earth, that's how much higher my, my ways are and my thoughts are than yours. In other words, he says, if you want to work with me, you're going to have to lift your thinking up to my level. I like a quote that says, I refuse to drag the word of God down to the level of my experience. Instead, by faith, I want to bring my experience up to the level of the word of God. That God's word is true and never fails. So finally, they got everybody out of the house. Why? Because they were ridiculing Jesus. They were unbelieving. They were polluting the atmosphere in this home. And then in verse 41, it says, Then Jesus took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, and she was 12 years of age. Here we see an amazing miracle that happened in the life of Jairus, but he needed to walk with Christ for some time. He started by praying and calling out and seeking Jesus. Then he had to be patient while Jesus delayed his journey. Then he had to rejoice with somebody else's miracle before he received his own. And last of all, he found things going backwards. He got a message from home that said, it's got worse. But even when things got worse, Jesus said, believe. You keep believing because I'm still with you. And as they traveled together then, and they got into his house. Jesus said, let's change the atmosphere. From an atmosphere that's contradicting and ridiculing my words to one of faith. And finally everything was ready. And Jesus reached out and raised his daughter. And I think for each one of us, you know, there can be challenges we can go through. Challenges perhaps for a loved one. Or business, career or dreams or some of the promises that we feel that God has spoken to us. But I believe that God says we need to keep walking with Him. And we say, Lord Jesus, if you will bring your hand and touch my life, it will be transformed. If you bring your hand and touch my business or my family member or this situation that I'm concerned about, it will be different. That's what Jairus said. If you will come and lay your hands upon my daughter, it will be 
different. There are times when we feel powerless to change something, and that's why God has given us the privilege of prayer. But as we do, we just continue to walk with Him. And sometimes the circumstance doesn't change immediately. Sometimes it may get worse. But God says, just believe. Continue to believe and trust because He's alive and not dead. He's building relationship in the process. And that which He has said will come to pass. Amen? Why don't we just bow our heads and love to pray for you.